Howdy folks, Spencer here, and today I want to take you on a tour of what I believe the best beam overload ships in Star Trek Online are. Now, just a standard disclaimer, this is the list of ships that I think are the best for beam overload, and I believe statistically the, the list is fairly accurate, but it's always possible that I'm wrong, so uh, just standard disclaimer in that case that this is what I believe the best ships are for beam overload. As always, chapters are listed down below if you want to skip ahead to any specific talking points, but as with any of these best of videos, I'm going to spend the first part of the video talking about the build type. So what are the basics of Beam Overload? Beam Overload is a firing mode that specifically is only going to boost beam-based weapons, so things like beam arrays, including your omnidirectional beams, or dual beam banks. It's not going to affect, you know, things like cannons or turrets. Those have a different firing mode for single target called cannon rapid fire. So beam overload specifically for beams. What it does is it gives you a substantial boost to the base damage of your beams. In exchange, it lowers the firing rate of your beams for, for 10 seconds. So it is a substantial damage boost, but at the same time, your weapons are firing half as fast. Now you can make up for a lot of that with firing cycle haste abilities or traits or things like that. Uh, so that's generally not much of an issue, but just note that you are firing substantially slower than normal. By default, you can have up to a 66% uptime with beam overload. It's up for 10 seconds when you hit it, and it has a minimal cooldown of 15 seconds. However, there is a starship trade called Super Weapon Ingenuity that will ex give beam overload another 5 seconds, which gives you 100% uptime. So beam overload would be up for 15 seconds, and as soon as it is over, you can hit it again, and it's back up for another 15 seconds. So... Uh, it's it's very easy to extend the uptime of beam overload, and that's one of the things that makes people like it. So why do people use beam overload? It, it's the most popular play style I feel right now. Uh, when I started doing these best of videos, beam overload was by and far the most demanded uh, video in, out of any of the play styles I was talking about. Beam overload is just extremely popular right now, and it's because of the reasons you see on the screen. Uh, the first is, you know, it's immersive. It makes your beams fire like they did in the shows or movies. So people like it because it's a very canon experience. There's also the aspect of it just being simple. You know, when you compare it to something like Canon Scatter Volley, with Canon Scatter Volley, you have to think about how you're positioning yourself to maximize uptime uh, to be able to hit multiple targets at a time. Whereas with beam overload, you're hitting one target at a time. So there's less thinking to do and it's just easier to fly. So a lot of people very much prefer that rather than a uh, cannon scatter volley where they have to think a ton about how they're positioning the ship and planning ahead of where they're going to put their ship next to maximize up uptime later on down the line. With beam overload, you're just always hitting one target. It's just much simpler to fly. And then of course there's the high single target damage potential. Everyone likes to see their ship doing big numbers and for a lot of people, that's exactly what beam overload does. So beam overload hits extremely hard against a single target. Uh, we'll look at the numbers here on the next slide, but a lot of people like seeing the five or six digit numbers from their beam overload hits. And the last thing is that basically every ship in STO can run beam overload. It only requires an ensign tack seat, so basically anything can run it. So performance wise, you know, compared to Cannon Scatter Volley, nothing's going to win other than Torps or EPG. When it comes to energy weapon performance, Cannon Scatter Volley beats everything. But it's got that higher skill requirement, and not everyone likes to have cannons firing from their ships. So, when you're looking at single target options, Beam Overload ends up being the third best option. 
So what beats it is surgical strikes, which I've done a video about and exceed rated limits also barely beats out uh, beam overload. But the issue with exceed rated limits is, and surgical strikes is that only a few ships can run them. Surgical strikes is an Intel ability. Thus it requires a ship with a commander Intel seat and exceed rated limits is miracle worker. So it's going to require that you have a ship with a commander miracle worker seat. Uh, beam overload three goes into a Lieutenant commander tack seat and any ship that has a Lieutenant commander tack can run beam overload three. Any ship that has an ensign tack can run beam overload one. So while beam overload may not hit as hard, you have a much larger ship selection and you can build around it easier because exceed rated limits, surgical strikes, they go into a commander slot. Beam Overload 3 goes into a Lieutenant Commander slot. So Beam Overload, while it does perform slightly worse, is just easier to build around. So here's a couple things I want to shout out as nice to have for Beam Overload. Um, as I have noted here, as with any energy weapon build, having your weapon power higher is going to equal more damage from your weapons. Now, it pains me Every time I go and look at like the, the STO category on Twitch, I see people that have their, their power levels set like this, basically. And by doing this, you're, you're lowering your damage. If I lower the weapon power even more here, and I hover over a cannon here, do you see how the, the damage is just... Like it was dropping there as the, the power was going down? Your energy weapons scale with your weapons power, so... If you're someone just running like balanced weapon power where you're it just looks like this, you are lowering your damage output. So if I look here right now, I'm at 2350. It's just jumping around on me. So I'm at 2361.1 DPS. Now, if I increase my weapon power by turning to the attack preset on, I'm already several hundred DPS higher there. Now, I have quite a few things on here that are just passively giving me damage boost in that. So my numbers on this build are going to be higher than what you'd probably have. But hopefully you get the point of if you've just got balanced power levels like this, you are very much lowering your damage output. And if you have your weapon power even lower for whatever reason, you are just substantially limiting your damage potential on your build. So if you did not already have your power levels maxed out, get that sorted out. Very easy to fix. Just turn your weapon power up to maximum. You do more damage. So abilities like emergency powered weapons, which is an engineering ability. Uh, you can run that on most ships also. That's very good to have. And if you have an Intel seat, you can run override subsystem safeties, which can increase your maximum power cap by up to 50. So by default, you have a cap of 125 power or of like weapon power. And if you hit OSS at its peak, it will let you have up to 175 uh, weapon power. So very substantial boost. Very good to have if you can get it. Beam Overload likes it. Any firing mode likes that. The other thing I want to shout out here as nice to have for beam overload is recursive shearing. So I talked about recursive shearing a bit earlier this year when the Vanguard specialist trait came out on the legendary Jemadar attack ship. Uh, recursive shearing, you mark it on a target and it takes a portion of the damage you do to that target every second and will give you that as bonus against that target. So if I do a million damage to a target in one second, rank three of recursive shearing is giving me another 300k. So very substantial boost, and it works very well with single target abilities, especially beam overload. So beam overload is a very old firing mode. It's been around for ages and underwent several rebuilds. Beam overload did not always work like it currently does. Uh, used to be quite bad, and then they rebuilt it to make it good. But there are loads of starship traits that interact with it. 
And the, the most notable one is that super weapon ingenuity I mentioned before. This allows you to have 100% uptime on your beam overload, but it does come from a Lobby ship, the Zindi Primate Adalith. You can acquire that on the exchange also for like 400 mil, but uh, it is a bit pricey. But if you are really dead set on a beam overload build, it's worth it. It is that that's a huge boost for an overload build. Next up, we have preferential targeting, which comes from any of the T6 NX uh, variants. And when you hit cannon scatter volley, uh, you don't have to have any cannons on. You just have to have the cannon scatter volley ability on your build. You just spam put that on your spam bar. And every time you hit the CSV, it's giving your beam overload a 100% cat one damage boost for 20 seconds, I think it is. So it has 100% uptime. And 100% cat one is basically like having an extra two and a half tack consoles on. So if you can get that trait, it's pretty solid for beam overload. The last trait I want to mention here that is really notable is directed energy flux, which is from the Husnock warship, which is another Lobi ship. It will give you 25% cat two for beam overload when you hit temporal abilities or directed energy modulation. So 25% cat two is the same damage boost you would get from attack power in Omega three. And it's like half of the damage boost of an attack power in alpha. So it's a pretty substantial boost and uh, definitely worth looking at if you have access to it. So now I want to take a look at ship options at a variety of tiers. Now, I, I've been wanting to include some budget ships here, and I pretty much have the exact same ones here as that, uh, that I had in the Cannon Scatter Volley video. There's not a ton of free ships you get with the, the free T5 options at level 40 and 61, uh, but these were the ones that I recommended for Cannon Scatter Volley. They're the same ones that I'd recommend for Beam Overload, Fire at Will, Cannon Rapid Fire. They're just really solid ships. It's really all there is to say about it. For feds, that's the patrol escort. For ROMs, the Hefe assault warbird. And for KDF, the Hegta heavy bird of prey. If you want to take a look at the, the bridge officer seatings there, uh, pause the video to look at them. I'll have these all linked in the description also if you want to take a look at the wiki pages. But um, these aren't really anything special. They're just absolute budget options. You're brand new to the game and you're looking for something. But they're going to get the job done. At level 61, it's the same recommendations also as the Cannon Scatter Volley video. At level 61, you get a token that lets you get a free tier five sea store ship. And my recommendations for the feds are gonna be uh, the Defiant Tactical Escort Retrofit. That's the tier five Defiant. It's, it's an okay ship, it's not the best. The tier six versions of the Defiant are much better, especially the Adamant. But if you're looking at getting one of the free ones or that free tier five, this, this is a decent ship. For ROMs, the Delon Warbird uh, Retrofit, extremely solid. It's a very good option and it has a Lieutenant Universal on it. That means you could run an Ox to Bat setup on it. That's what I used on it when I actually used the ship probably about a decade ago. And then for KDF, I've got the Fakiri Karfi Battle Carrier. Uh, this is a science carrier, but it's got a Lieutenant Commander tack and a Lieutenant tack. It's also got two hangar bays. Even though it's got a Commander Psy, this is still a very strong beam overload option. It's, it's really just a very strong overall option uh, for ener any energy weapon based build. It's going to work very well. Now, if you're not looking at those, you, you've already claimed your free uh, level 40 ship and your free level 61 ship, and you're looking at some other options that might be on the exchange, I'm going to do the same recommendations here again as the Cannon Scatter Volley video, which are the Herogen Hunter and the Sphere Builder Erebus Destroyer. These worked well for Cannon Scatter Volley, and they're going to work extremely well for Beam Overload. These are both tactically focused ships and like they're, they're 
they're good. Like for, for what they cost, they are good ships. In fact, what do they cost right now? If I go down to Deep Space Nine, and I take a look. I imagine both are going to be very, very cheap. If I can get through the door without it lagging up. The Herogen. The Herogen Hunter. A million EC. And then the Sphere Builder. Three million. So the Herogen Hunter's a very cheap ship. The Sphere Builder's not that much more. It's It was also fairly affordable. Either of those ships you can easily obtain. Even if you're a brand new player, grinding up a million or even three million energy credits, very easy. So now I'm going to start to move into some of the paid options, and we're going to take a look at some sea store ships. So the thing with Beam Overload is there's abilities that mesh well with it, like I mentioned, like recursive shearing or override subsystem safeties. But it's, you know, at the end of the day, it's just beams, and if you can use that, if there's, you know, a ship like the Vanguard Warship that's got Miracle Worker, it's capable of boosting up any energy weapons quite substantially. It's going to, you know, it's not going to be the best beam overload platform, but it's going to have so much firepower behind it that it makes up for it. Uh, so the Vanguard Warship, very solid option. Commander TAC, Lieutenant Commander TAC with Miracle Worker. Lieutenant Commander Engineer, so you can run an Emergency Powered Weapons 3. Or it's an Ensign Psy and then a Lieutenant Universal. This is a 5-3 setup, so if you're doing a dual beam bank setup, you would do five dual beam banks, uh, two Omnis aft, and then because this is Miracle Worker, you would use a turret as your third aft weapon and then use the Mixed Armament Synergy ability. Uh, which is a miracle worker ability that when it, when you use multiple weapon types like a cannon and a beam it's going to give you a damage boost for your beams and cannons so as soon as you fire that cannon you're boosting your beams so miracle worker can work out right there and with the vanguard warship it's just a really good option the other thing i have here is the terran adamant heavy raider this has a full intel seat and it's only got a lieutenant temporal seat unfortunately so you can't do a recursive shearing but you can do oss3 on it to override some system, system safeties three uh it's a 5-1 setup with an experimental weapon and it's the same thing you're you're basically just boosting the your beams through brute force it doesn't have necessarily a ton of abilities other than oss that are going to synergize well with uh overload but uh it's just able to boost your beams up quite substantially so both are very solid options and are, are on this list just because of the the brute force the brute force aspect of how well they can boost any energy weapon build now, for some more beam overload focused sea store options that have things that are going to synergize a little bit better, I've got the Terran Cygnus Battlecruiser. This is a ship that I did not rate very well when I uh, initially reviewed it. It's a 5 3 Galaxy. It's got a Lieutenant TAC with command, another Lieutenant TAC, and if you want to run Beam Overload 3 on it, you have to run the Lieutenant Commander Universal as a tack. So it's a case where it's pretty much too much tactical seating, which is not always the most ideal thing. However, it's got a Commander Engineer with Temporal on it. So it does have Recursive Shearing 3. So uh, it's not the, the best ship in the game, but it does have access to Recursive Shearing, and you can technically run Beam Overload 3 on it. It's a 5-3 setup. It's a Galaxy class. I, I think for a lot of people, it's going to check a lot of boxes because it is a... Uh, you can make it look like a normal Galaxy, and it's, it's not the best layout, but it can work. And that's the important thing. The other sea store ship here I have is the Kronos Temporal Dreadnought Cruiser. 
Uh, straight up, this is not going to work with dual beam banks. This is a ship you're going for if you're using beam arrays. It's a 4-4 weapon setup. Uh, Lieutenant Commander Tack, Commander Engineer with Temporal, Ensign Engineer, uh, Lieutenant Commander Science, and then a Lieutenant Universal with Temporal Operative. So it's it's not the best seating in the world, but you have a ton of room for Uncon procs, and especially remember Temporal has access to a lot of really nice unconventional systems procs to help reduce the cooldown of your Universal Consoles. It does also have a hangar bay, if that's something you care about. So fleet-wise, there's really only one ship that I'm going to point out, but it has four different versions. They're all the same ship, basically. The, the one exception is the Romulan one has a Singularity Core, and the Jemadar Vanguard one is a Vanguard ship, so it does have the, the Vanguard wingmen. So if you're getting any of these, the Jemadar Vanguard one is going to be the highest performer because it's got the, the wingmen on it for free, basically. Uh, it's got a commander tack with temporal operative, lieutenant tack with temporal operative. So again, while it is a lot of temporal operative seating, you are going to have room for a bunch of uncon abilities. Lieutenant engineer, lieutenant commander science, and a lieutenant universal. So you can run that as another engineer if you want, do an ox to bat setup if you're on a budget. Or you can run it as a Psy and just have loads of Uncon procs on the build. So it's a very strong option. And if you're looking at options you can get with your fleet ship modules, the Jemadar uh, Temporal Warship is going to get my recommendation. So taking a look at some legendary options, I've got the Legendary NX here is the top one. Uh, this comes with the preferential targeting starship trait. That's the one where when you hit cannon scatter volley, you're giving your beam overload a 100% cat one for 20 seconds. So the, that's the trait that basically you just have CSV on your build. You don't even have to have a cannon on. Just have CSV on your build, put it on your spam bar, and you're getting an extra two and a half tack consoles worth of damage boost, basically. So... Legendary NX is from the 10th Anniversary Bundle. It's got a Commander Tack with Temporal Operative, Lieutenant Commander Tack, Lieutenant Engineer, Lieutenant Commander Science with Temporal Operative, and an Ensign Universal. So, might be a tad heavy on the tack seating, which is sort of weird to say, but it works well. It's a 5-2 weapon setup plus Experimental. It's got plenty of tack consoles, really solid ship. And the second legendary option I have here is the legendary Miranda multi-mission cruiser. Uh, while I have this on here, I'm going to recommend against it. The, the fact is, this is from the TOS Captain Bundle, which is 12,000 Zen. That's 120 bucks. And all you get in that bundle is this ship and an instant level token that only works for the Agents of Yesterday or TOS characters. Like, it's cool but not 120 bucks cool. So this ship's a 5-3 with a hangar bay. It's got a Lieutenant Commander Tack, Commander Engineer of Temporal Operative, Lieutenant Commander Science with Pilot, Lieutenant Universal, Anson Universal. While the pilot seating is not the most ideal, just a reminder, you can use Pilot to trigger Cold Hearted. So if you have the Cold Hearted Starship trait and we're looking at a, a pilot option that had also or a ship with pilot and recursive shearing uh you know maybe look at this but that's going to be a pretty niche thing to be looking for for the carrier i'm going to recommend the terran acheron dreadnought carrier i think i'm pronouncing that right this is a recent infinity lockbox ship that has two hangar bays and being it is an alternative version of the Styx, it actually gets access to the Styx frigate pets, which are not the highest damage dealing pets in the game, but they have a lot of utility to them. So the pets are frigates that have Suppression Barrage 3, which is going to cut down on the amount of damage incoming to yourself and your team. And they have Attack Pattern Beta 3, which is the best attack pattern uh, you can hope for on a bridge officer. 
because that's going to be debuffing the resistance of any of the enemies that they're shooting at. So pretty solid hanger pets, really good debuffs on them. The damage is a little bit lackluster, but uh, you can slot two of them on the ship. You could also, if you wanted, slot anything else. You know, it's two hangar bays. You don't have to slot these Terran uh, frigates. If you wanted to run sad and the rare toe douche pets, you could do that. Uh, but the, the Terran frigates, very nice to have on here. So I've got a video talking about this ship and I'll have it linked at the top right if you want to go check that out. But this ship, 5-2 weapon setup, two hangar bays. Commander TAC with uh, Temporal Operative, Lieutenant TAC, Lieutenant Commander Engineer, Lieutenant Commander Universal Temp Op, and another Ensign Universal. Uh, the, the negative with this ship was it being a, you know, an Infinity Lockbox ship. They're very expensive right now, at like 1.4 billion EC. And the fact that the uh, secondary specialization seat was the same as the primary with a lot of these premium ships, the lockbox ships, you expect that the second specialization seat is not going to be the same specialization as the commander spec. So I uh, was not a big fan of that and still am not. Next up is the Delkina Command Strike Wing Warbird. Uh, this is on here just because of the brute force aspect of it. The Delkina just has so much firepower potential that whatever energy weapon setup you're looking to put on it, or even torps, it works for both torps or energy weapons. Whatever you slap on it, so long as you're a competent pilot, the ship is just going to slam. It is a very powerful ship. It is a Romulan ship though, so it does have a singularity core, but it also has a Romulan battle cloak. So, very hard hitting ship, 5 2 weapon setup with an experimental weapon. Commander TAC with command. Lieutenant TAC, Lieutenant Commander Inge, a Lieutenant Commander Universal with Intel, and an Ensign Universal. So it does have command, but for a beam overload build, that means you could run the Commander TAC uh, slot that has command. You could run Call Emergency Artillery 3. And then on the Lieutenant Commander Intel seat there, you could run Override Subsystem Safeties 3. It's just an extremely hard hitting ship and uh, it would have been ignorant of me to have not included it on this list because I've used this with a Beam Overload build before in Hive and it just absolutely slammed whatever I was hitting. So very good ship, can recommend it for a lot of different builds. Next up is the Vodwar Juggernaut. This is a promo ship that's also in the Lost in Delta Quadrant Muds bundle. Um, in the Cannon Scatter Volley build I did, or the video I did, this and the Delkina were tied at first place. The Delkina has a lot of firepower to it, and it's the same with the Vodwar Juggernaut. You know, at the end of the day, all you need to know about the Vodwar Juggernaut is it can run seven TAC consoles. This, this thing is, it's just insanely powerful. And on top of that, you have a commander TAC with Miracle Worker, a Lieutenant Commander TAC with Intel, Lieutenant Commander Engineer, Lieutenant Psy, Ensign Universal. So you can run all of the best Miracle Worker abilities. You can run the best Intel abilities, like uh, Override Subsystem Safeties 3. You can run Emergency Power to Weapons 3. This thing just has a lot of raw firepower behind it. And while it's most often used with Cannon Scatter Volley builds, um, there's no reason you could not put a Beam Overload build on this and just absolutely devastate whatever opponent you're going up against. Next up is the Husnok Warship. So this is the ship you saw at the, the beginning in the, the background. I'm covering one of the consoles here, but the Husnok is a ship that has been very popular for a long time for single target uh, builds. You probably saw if you're if you've been around for a long time. Um, this is the ship that myself and Omega Fighter were using to go into like Infected five or six years ago. 
and just go in with the cannon rapid fire build and we would target the gateway first and just take out the gateway before any other part of the map was destroyed. Uh, you know, the, the, the reason they now have a shield around the gateway at the start, it wasn't always like that. Back in the day, you could just go directly to the gateway and take it out before even taking out the sides. So the Husnock has always been a good single target platform and it still holds true with beam overload. And I have noted here that the two piece console set is what really makes the ship stand out. And I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but the layout of the ship, 5-3, five, 5 TAC consoles, Commander TAC with Temporal Operative, so Recursive Shearing, Lieutenant Commander Engineer, so there's your Merge Power to Weapons 3, an Ensign Engineer, not a fan of that, Lieutenant Psy with Command, and then a Lieutenant Commander Universal. So that Lieutenant Commander Universal does offer a bit of flexibility, you can run that as another tack or as a psi. Just gives you a lot of options, but it's the console set that, like I have written here, that really makes this ship stand out. So let's take a look at that. The Husnock console itself isn't that amazing. It's just uh, doing some electrical damage to your target. The Miradorn console is what really stands out. And the Miradorn is a lockbox ship but it's actually in the C store in, as part of the Captain Picard bundle. So it is a, it is a lockbox ship, but there's actually a bundle in the C store that has it in it that you can grab at any time. So let's look up Captain Picard. And this has a base price of 12,000 Zen or 120 bucks. Uh, but if you wait for a sale, this goes up to a 35% sale, which is 7,800 Zen. You can get the Miradorn Raider unlocked account wide. Just note, however, this bundle also has the Tommy gun in it. And Cryptic really screws you over with this because you only get the Tommy gun on whatever character you buy the bundle on. So if you do buy the bundle, uh, just be careful with what character you're buying it on. Now, the Miradorn console has a passive there. Pretty good passives, 1.5% crit chance, that's nice. But the clicky on it is where it really shines. Two self, plus 15% crit chance for 20 seconds, plus 33% crit severity for 20 seconds. And the bottom thing here is what also really matters. Two self, Raider and Intel flanking damage bonus increased by 33% for 20 seconds. So, it gives you 15% crit chance, 33% severity, and makes your flanking 33% better for 20 seconds. Now, the Husnock is not a raider, but if you have Intel as your primary specialization, that adds flanking to whatever ship you're on. So if you have that on and you have this console, it's very good to take advantage of it. Now, the two-piece for running both the Husnock and Miradorn consoles uh, is you get a recharge reduction on the Miradorn console, you get more damage out of the Husnock console, and you get a very small amount of hole pens. So it's very good if you have the Husnock to run the Miradorn console alongside the Husnock console. It's pretty much the point of you running the Husnock. And if you do that... It's just a really strong boost for your beam overload setup on the Husnock. Next up is the D7 Temporal Battlecruiser, and this is a promo ship. There's multiple D7s now in the promo box, so be careful with what you're choosing. Uh, but this will be listed as the, or in the box that's listed as 23rd Century Tier 6 Ship Box. If you're looking on the exchange, be very careful. People love to try and uh, screw with people that are going for these. So, oh, there's none up right now, but sometimes the, um, the, the box that has the Atlas in it, if any, the, like the, the prototype Dreadnought, the, the ship that has the DPRM, there's an older version of the box that is named very similar to the promo ship box here. Uh, so be careful 
when if you're looking at the exchange so that you don't get uh, screwed over and just buy the wrong one. There's none up right now, but in the future there might be. So just be careful and make sure if you do buy one of these, you're buying the right thing. So bridge officer seating on this is Lieutenant Commander Tack, a commander engineer with temporal operative, so recursive shearing, a Lieutenant Commander Science, so some on Comprox, and a Lieutenant Commander Universal with Intel. So there's your OSS-3. This is a 5-3 weapon setup, four attack consoles, battle cloak weapon system efficiency. It's just got a lot of things going for it. And it's also the only ship that can do both recursive shearing three, OSS three, emergency powered weapons three, beam overload three. Very strong platform. And if I were using my event campaign box to get a beam overload ship, this would be it. The D7 Temporal Battle Cruiser is just a very strong ship uh, for these single target builds. Recursive Shearing 3, OSS 3, Emergency Powered Weapons 3, very, very strong platform. Which leads me to my top five beam overload ships. Number one, the D7 Temporal. Like I said, if I were going out and setting up a beam overload ship right now, that's the ship that I would be using because it's got Battle Cloak, Recursive Shearing 3, Override Subsystem Safeties 3, it's got, it's a cruiser that has the weapon power command aura, so, so my weapons are going to drain less power when they fire. It can run Beam Overload 3. Just a very strong and capable platform. So that's my top pick. Second is the Husnock, but only if you have the two-piece console set. The Husnock is a very capable ship on its own. But if you're really wanting to get the most out of it, you need to have the two piece on that two piece is very good. Number three is the Delkina. While the Delkina does not have recursive shearing, uh, like I talked about when I was talking about it, it's just got that raw firepower aspect. Same thing goes for the Vaudoir Juggernaut. And I could even honestly probably toss the inquiry in above the Acheron. Uh, they're all just such powerful ships. The Vodwar Juggernaut's got seven TAC consoles. The Delkina can have six TAC consoles. It's got the Romulan Cloak. It has a commander command seat, so you can run call emergency artillery in. It's just a very powerful platform. Same for the Vodwar Juggernaut. And while the Terran Acheron has a lot of the things that hit the like hit the checklist for beam overload. The Delkina, Vaudevar Juggernaut, and, and probably the Inquiry just have so much raw firepower potential that it'd be ignorant of me to, to not have them high up on the list. So, you know, let me know if you agree or disagree with that list. You know, if you agree or disagree with anything I've said here. I just, I really think that the D7 Temporal, very good platform. The Husnock with the console sets, really good. And I've used the Delkina with Beam Overload before. I know that that is just such a powerful ship if built outright. So let me know what you think. And tomorrow on my stream, uh, because I'm releasing this on Friday and I'll be doing a stream tomorrow on Saturday. My goal is to actually build out a D7 Temporal Battle Cruiser on the stream. So my friend Nick, very nice guy, Australian, so he's a... Uh, He's inspired the, the name here, the IKS Convict, but I'm going to be building this out on stream. He gifted me this ship last week, and I just was not uh, mentally ready to deal with it with uh, just COVID and all that. So that that's thankfully uh, calmed down a bit, and I want to get this built out. So if you want to watch me build out a Beam Overload build, if you're watching this uh, today on Friday, um, you know, make sure to stop by the stream tomorrow. It'll probably be around noon central time, U.S. central time. I'll probably have that going for a few hours. Uh, and if you miss the stream, 
it'll be up as a VOD to watch afterwards, just like any other video on the channel. But that is going to be it for today. Thank you again to all channel members. I believe this list is correct. Uh, if you have any questions or comments again about any of the things I talked about today, feel free to drop them down below and I'll get back to you when I can. But that's it for now. Thanks for watching. See you guys next time.